Welcome, folks. Uh, before we get started in the program, I have extended an invitation for a few of the candidates to show up a little early. So I'm going to give uh, 60 seconds to Bob, who's running against Greg for uh, one of the commissioner's seats. Uh, Bob, do you want to jump in and tell us a little bit about yourself, your campaign? Thank, thank you, Eric. Yes, uh, my name is Bob Zorowski, and I'm running for district uh, commissioner, District 2. And my background has been, um, gosh, 20-some 20, 20 years as a strategic planner, um, working with businesses and helping them solve their issues. And then uh, also, what, almost 30 years teaching at the university, and I teach strate strategic planning as well. So it's been kind of fun. Part of my background is uh, trying to encourage groups to work together, look at the future, and that's been my platform is we have a 50-year plan basically with the rural reserves and the urban reserves and looking at that in the future, trying to encourage all groups to work together in terms of coming together with a common vision. So that's kind of my background and I'm be, I'll be here and happy to answer specific questions if anybody has any for me. Thank you. Eric? Well, folks, I wanted to uh, start today's forum program. We have uh, Rachel and Jaime from Hillsborough Empowers Youth. This uh, organization is one that, uh, well, I'm, an, I'm employed by. I have a contract to uh, uh, manage their board of directors, and uh, so I'm pleased to see all my bosses here. And uh, um, a couple neat things are happening behind the scenes, w one of which is that uh, the March races are starting to get booked for the forum. So for those of you who are not aware, the epic event for the forum is the election season. And that's where we get to ask, probe, prod, and tear apart opponents in political races. And that is really the meat of this organization. Blood red meat. Those questions, I love them. And uh, so Bob, I hope you know what you're getting yourself into. It's, uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, and behind the scenes, there's a lot of neat technology going on. What I'm hoping to do is uh, have some live streaming going on, so we'll be able to invite an internet audience as well. Uh, that's uh, some of the technology for that is starting to get plugged together behind the scenes. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to do is just remind you that uh, forum decorum is that only members ask questions during the event, and that you're free to interact with our speakers before and after, but only forum members noted with the blue badges instead of the red badges, um, uh, have the ability to ask questions during the program. So please respect that. What I'd like you to do is now please give a hand for Rachel and Jaime from Hillsborough Empowers Youth. Thank you, Eric. Good afternoon. Is it noon? Is it afternoon? Yeah, it'll yeah. work. Thank okay. you all for showing up. <laughs> Thank you for having us. So we are from Hillsborough Empowers Youth, um, which is obviously an organization that is specifically out of Hillsboro. Um, as Eric mentioned, I'm Rachel Hawley. I am a board member. I've been with Hay for about seven years now. Um, actually, the outgoing chair. Um, I'm looking forward to getting to sit back a little bit and enjoy helping the organization from a board standpoint rather than the executive team. Um, I also work for Washington County, so I have um, a huge investment in this organization's success, um, not only for the Hillsborough community, but also because I believe in the ripple effect it has on the larger community, which is our county. Uh, Jaime Rodriguez, I've been a board member for about a year now. Uh, I've been a resident of the Hillsborough area for about 15 years and a board member again for about a year. I work for Portland Community College as a career specialist and also slash veterans resource coordinator over at Rock Creek. Uh, and I began, I've been with the board member. I have a daughter who's a senior in high school. She's been able to make it through that young life of hers, uh, drug free, and I just wanna see where I can put my influence and my input with the board. So some of you guys may be familiar, but for those who are not, I just wanna take a few minutes to talk about what is Hay. Um, so we are a drug and alcohol prevention coalition um, that's based out of Hillsboro. Um, we're really focusing on school-aged youth um, specifically because that's where prevention starts. It's with our young folks in the community. 
Um, we formed in about 2006 out of the Hillsborough School District. Um, they had a special grant called the Safe Schools Healthy Students, and one of the things they recognized as important was having um, a drug-free student body. And so they developed, it was Hillsborough together originally, and then after about a year, we shifted over to um, Hay as a nonprofit organization. Apparently I'm not close enough to the mic. <laughs> um, as a nonprofit organization that was also um, funded by SAMHSA, um, <clears throat> the Drug Free Communities Grant, which really is intended to have an environmental impact on the community. So really, rather than focusing on programming, um, on what kind of things can we do to impact our community at an environmental level. Um, so looking at kind of just the culture within our community, what kind of things do we portray as normal, et cetera. Uh, in 2008, we were funded as a nonprofit, which allows us to get donations and fundraise. So what's a coalition? Why are we here today? Um, a coalition is essentially a group of community members that are working together towards a common goal. Um, as I mentioned, the common goal here is drug and alcohol prevention within our student body um, and the general community of Hillsborough. Uh, stakeholders include um, nonprofit organizations, youth-based organizations, law enforcement, of course schools, anybody where there's a youth activity going on is considered a, um, a community partner. That's an ideally one of the things that we're looking for is to really span the gamut of different types of people within the community um, as far as representation and partnerships goes because we recognize that's the way we're likely to be most effective at getting into all the nooks and crannies of our community. Um, so we've had a lot of changes, as I mentioned. We were funded by the Drug Free Communities Grant that actually just ended in September of 2013. Um, and with that, we've got a little more freedom, actually, in how we are able to um, focus our energies. Um, we're not only restricted now to focusing on environmental things, but we can look at programming um, and other th ways that we can impact our communities. Um, so with that has come the, the new challenge of looking for new types of funding. Um, and we've also got a new staff person, as Eric mentioned. Um, Eric Squires has been an amazing addition to Hillsborough Empowers Youth. Obviously, incredible community connections, um, as well as just lots of ideas about ways to be more innovative and to touch our community, lots of media connections, et cetera. Um, we feel that the, um, the re reducing um, substance drug abuse is gonna take a team effort. It's gonna take the whole city of, of Hillsborough and their partners and organizations as well. That's so one of the things that happened with the loss of our drug-free communities funding is essentially, it was kind of a time I think where a lot of people who have been with Hay for a while decided to um, pursue other endeavors or really just, they had a lot going on and it was time to step away for a while. So we've had some pretty big changes. Um, our, our board is evolving pretty significantly, which has been neat. We've got some really fresh blood, some people <laughs> that are really excited to dive into this um, prevention endeavor, which it really is a long-term effort that requires a lot of energy. So it's very exciting to have some new folks. Uh, we're looking at building our executive team back up. Mm -hmm. Right now we're, I think, about half staffed, yes. so certainly are in need of, of some new folks. But Eric's been amazing. We've got a new treasurer, Kim, who's just taken this on. Um, so we are really, really excited about what's to come, um, but are also looking forward to hopefully getting new folks into that board with us to help us make big decisions about where are we focusing our energies, how are we going to fund those things, who are our best partners going to be. Um, and certainly one thing that we want to touch on is uh, what is prevention? I think that's kind of a nebulous term that can be um, taken a lot of different ways, essentially. Um, so one of the things that I learned from a, a gentleman who does a lot of drug and alcohol work um, is about the five A's of prevention. And this essentially kind of spans the, the whole gamut, if you ask me. So there's um, acceptability, which is basically looking at the perception within our community of how harmful it is to use substances, um, and also the perception of whether or not adults, parents, teachers, counselors, et cetera, whether or not they disapprove of those things. Um, whether or not we realize it, if our young people perceive it to be acceptable from the adults, they're more likely to do it. Availability, the second A, 
availability is the perceived prevalence that um, the drugs are out there. Um, we try to ensure that you know it's a limited, it's limited, it's controlled, and that we're making sure that our youth are aware of what can uh, drugs can do to you. So again, availability. The third is accessibility, and that causes the ease of access. That's so. How easy is it for kids to get drugs? <laughs> Unfortunately, really easy. Um, we, as part of um, our community assessment, which we'll dive into in a minute, interviewed a lot of folks within the community, police officers, school counselors, parents, and um, there was a very, very consistent message that it's easy for kids to get substances, um, to get alcohol within their home, um, sometimes other drugs within the home. Um, prescription drugs have been kind of an increasing thing that we've seen. Um, so getting them is, is no no challenge. It's just a simply a matter of whether or not do they want to get them. And then, of course, we talk about the age of the onset, uh, trying to get them as early as possible so they're aware of it. They're aware of it as early as possible. The likelihood of them being aware at a younger age means that they won't get addicted at a, um, at a, at a younger age. So it's about focusing not just on, on high school, but also the middle schools, too. Exactly. So if we are able to prevent young people from using um, and delay their first use, we dramatically decrease their likelihood of having addiction, which we all know addiction is a very, very costly um, impact on our community, whether it's with uh, offenders in the criminal justice system, substance abuse treatment, um, unemployment, et cetera. Obviously not everybody with a substance issue um, encounters those types of things, but we do know there's a huge cost on our society. So the longer we can delay that age of onset, the more likely we are to prevent longer term problems that are much more expensive. And then finally, the, the last of the A is advertising, which I think is our greatest threat uh, because of the, the impact of media that's out there. Uh, we can control what we can't, what we can, but marketers are also clever. Uh, they're very creative. And so that impact is always gonna be there. Uh, of course, advertisers, uh, marketers, they have a lot more money than we have. So that's an ongoing issue and the threat of the advertising that shows an impact on, on a youth. It can be very simple. You know, you show them a commercial or you show them a, a young superstar doing the bad things and they catch up with it. That's, I mean, and it spans so much past just advertising. Look at our TV shows, movies, reality TV, good Lord. Um, there's all kinds mm -hmm. of things that our kids see that make them think that certain things are normal and it essentially kind of perpetuates what we're looking at, the acceptability, this idea of prevalence that everybody's doing it. This is how you have a good time, et cetera. So the media is huge. Um, I'm with Jaime. It's probably going to be one of the biggest battles um, that we look to overcome, I think. But essentially, if we were to look at those previous four A's, I think that it starts to miti mitigate, at the very least, some of the risks that are presented by the media. So the other part of prevention is really targeting your community specifically. How do you do that? Well, first you have to take a look at your community and figure out what, what's the makeup there, what kind, what's your population look like, and really what are the issues. Uh, so Hay, as a part of the Drug Free Communities uh, grant, as well as just really wanted to be spot on with our efforts, did multiple community assessments. Our most recent was in 2012, and what we did was um, gather information from a variety of sources, uh, looking at national data, specifically around substance abuse, Oregon data, um, Washington County data. We managed to get a, a lot of information through the Student Wellness Survey, which is administered in most of the schools. D juvenile Department data, which looks at essentially who's been referred to the juvenile system for law violations, uh, specifically related to substance abuse, of course. DUI data, which Unfortunately, we do have teenagers getting DUIs. OLCC data, so the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, I believe mm -hmm. that is. That is. Uh, so what kind of, what our vendors are doing, are they making sure that they are taking responsible steps to preventing sales to minors, shoulder tapping, et cetera? Yeah. We also included Hillsborough data, uh, school surveys. Again, within um, the school surveys, we had wellness surveys. We had hate club surveys, um, H Hillsborough School District, Disciplinary data, which is done every spring, I believe, uh, and then stakeholder interviews. So first, what does Hillsboro look like? 
Well, it's uh, first and foremost an incredibly evolving community. What we've seen is um, every time they do the census, things are dramatically different. So I believe this census data was from 2010. Yes, 2010. Our most recent one so far. What we saw in the last 10 years, from 2000 to 2010, a 30% increase just in population alone. So we are a very, very growing community right now. Um, our ethnic distribution is also one, I think, to take note of. 62% of our community um, is made up of Caucasians, 86 of Asians, 2% of African Americans, 1% Native Americans, 10% other. And Hispanics, Latinos, 22.6%. Now, these numbers are about four years old, so you can fluctuate that. It's probably a, a change in percentage of about 2% to 4% on any one of these categories. Uh, when this was done, Hillsborough was at 92,000, and we're probably closer to 100,000 now, if not already. That's, and if you notice, too, under the Hillsborough School District, 34% of our student population is Hispanic. Uh, so that is an incredible representation within our school district that we really, really need to pay attention to. When we're looking at our majorities, uh, that really is one that we need to be focusing on. Our, our total minority population within the school district is up to 50%. There really is no majority at this point. So we need to be really cognizant of how we're focusing our energy on all different ethnic backgrounds, cultures, et cetera, to make sure that we're, we're really focused in those efforts. Yeah. Um, the last two lines, I, I think, are... Um not quite inconclusive of each other, because it's a 6% below the poverty line in Hillsborough, yet uh, the Hillsborough School District reports 46.3 are free or reduced lunch. My assumption is that the poverty is much above uh, 6%. Yeah, something doesn't jive there. Yeah. Um, so when we do this community assessment, looking specifically at those surveys, there's some specific things that we take a look at, and that's because they're really indicative of our success and prevention efforts, and also just measures to pay attention to so that we can start to measure population level change. So things that we look at include uh, tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana use, specifically with the sixth, eighth, and 11th graders. Um, Previous use, as in have they ever used, as well as 30-day use, have they used within the past 30 days? That's a really important one to pay attention to. Obviously, we need to kind of gauge that with the rest of the state, as well as the rest of the country. We're also looking at age of onset. As we mentioned, that's incredibly important when we're looking at long-term issues. Uh, the perception of risk along with that age of onset. We also reviewed other substances, you know, the ones that... Um, I guess what's trending now are the e-cigarettes. We've got to be aware of those. Um, any disciplinary data, is it, does it help if we disciplinary these youth, whether it's in the school system or from parents ourselves? How is that affecting them, and is it working? Um, harassment, is it peer pressure? Hey, smoke some of the e-cigarettes or, you know, sit in the house? So we got to look at that, what's going on with the harassment issue regarding youth. Then also the psychological distress, um, and that's just huge. Uh, most of these kids are at, again, we're focusing on middle age and high schoolers, that's a tough age at any, any place. It's a tough age, and we're trying to, um, I guess, get in, get in with them as, as soon as we can and, and educate them to the harms of drug abuse. So why do we care? Well, one, because we want to have a healthy community. Um, also because we want to have successful students here. And when we're looking at this school-age population, what we see is there are correlations uh, between a young person's choices outside of school and their academic performance. So if you look at here, there's a lot of different um, things to pay attention to. Certainly drugs and alcohol aren't the only one, but I will point you to um, folks that binge drink um, or are currently using drugs, including marijuana. If you can see the different colored lines up there, which is probably very small and hard to see, um, <laughs> you will see that it, binge drinking and current drug and alcohol use, the majority of the, the young people that engage in those are more likely to have Ds or Fs. Um, so there's a strong correlation with lower academic performance with those kids that are using. Um, obviously, that is not what we want for those young people looking, hopefully, to go to college um, and make, make more out of their futures, um, but certainly not what we want in our community either. Um, as you look, shift over to look at the 11th graders, those numbers just get even higher. Um, I think the, the disparities get even more significant as well. Okay. 
So we talked about perceptions. Um, there is something that we're doing really, really great here in Hillsboro, and it needs to be commended, recognized, and also it needs to be continued. And that is that eighth graders recognize that their parents don't approve of them using substances. So 93% of Hillsboro eighth grade students think their parents would disapprove if they used alcohol. Even higher, 96% said that of marijuana. That is an incredible message, as we recognize that's one of the five A's. Um, that young people know it's not acceptable from their parents. Um, and we can improve that just as adults in our community by making sure they know that we don't approve of that either. So it is an ongoing effort in educating parents as well as educating the youth of Hillsborough. Absolutely. That's so the other part of that is the perception of risk. Um, there's been, I think, a lot of shifts over the last several years, specifically around marijuana. We know there's been a lot of legislative change, and um, I'm not sure if that's related to some of the numbers that we've seen here, but it's really fascinating to see up to about 2009, eighth graders uh, were recognizing that they felt like it was pretty harmful. There was at least a moderate risk of using alcohol or marijuana, and something happened in 2009, and next thing you know, these numbers plummeted. A lot less kids are believing that it's risky for them to use uh, alcohol or marijuana. So whether, whether that's something that's happening with our community or regarding law change or accessibility or possibly use within the home, a lot of those things are really unknown what attributes to that, but certainly it's an important thing that we probably need to get to the bottom of if we are going to help students recognize there is a risk in this. This is eighth graders, that's what, 14 years old? thinking there's minimal risk in using substances. And it, and it just could be that the uh, fact that uh, medical marijuana is now more of awareness, and that could be some of the prevailing things that a youth is thinking about. Um. That's so looking at the same, same measurements, but just with 11th grade students, the exact same trend occurred right around the exact same time. So in 2009, we're seeing that decrease 53% uh, of students see that there's a moderate or high risk of using marijuana, which is really not too much lower than eighth graders, although there is a significant, significant difference between eighth graders and 11th graders when it comes to using alcohol. Um, so something happens again with our messaging around, is it acceptable for high school students to use alcohol? Is there a risk for that or is that the norm? Um, are your bodies ready for that? We all, I think, know as adults that that's absolutely not true. But nonetheless, that perception is existing uh, with our young people. So we certainly recognize that while we have some great things going on in our community, we have some things that need to improve. And Hay is at a really exciting juncture where we get to really refocus our efforts and decide what it is that we want to do, how do we want to go about doing that, who are the key players to engage. Um, so that's part of why we're here today, to talk about next steps. Yep, and, and it's about, you know, identifying possible funding sources, new grants, fundraising, uh, donations. Again, earlier we talked about the new, the new Hay leadership, and it's a transition, uh, but it's a good transition moving forward, uh, but we're always looking for more board members. We're currently only at about half of what we want to be. So um, again, uh, board development, building our coalitions, and community partnerships. Um, we, we don't want to be reinventing the wheel when there's another organization doing the same thing that we are and maybe um, collaborating on events, community events, where we can reach out a bit stronger and more, um, and more efficient to the community. We want to re-energize prevention clubs. At one point, Hay had prevention clubs in almost all the high schools and a few of the middle schools, which... Strike that, reverse oh, it. Okay. All the middle schools, um, and we're working on getting to the high schools. Um, but essentially, those groups were... Um, volunteers, they were kids that joined these after-school clubs that wanted to improve their school environment. What they were doing was focusing on um, providing education about the risks of drug and alcohol use as well as just healthy social norms. So that means dispelling the idea that everyone's doing it. The reality is everybody is not doing it. 80%, I want to say, of our eighth graders are not using alcohol or marijuana. That's the majority by far. But for some reason, we see that there's this perception that it's the other way around. So this group was really focusing on shifting that focus because what we know is if people perceive 
that it's acceptable, there's no risk, it's, it's happening everywhere, they're significantly more likely to do that. They've actually just come up with a calculation, which is quite amazing, um, that shows, I wanna say, it's like eight or nine times more likely. If you believe that's what's happening, you're eight or nine times more likely to engage in that behavior. So this group really focused on changing that perception um, and also just wanted to reinforce that it's cool to be drug and alcohol free. It's cool to do things that are healthy for your body that engage you physically and mentally that have nothing to do with substance abuse. Uh, and the other thing that we had done was really wanted to work on establishing a curriculum. These were based within the schools. They were ran after schools like clubs. And the school district, which is phenomenal, had said they would take this project on. They will make sure these clubs are up and running, um, but they need a curriculum. Uh, that's not necessarily their forte. And they really turned to Hay to look at how do we implement this prevention message and make sure that we're being really faithful to the model that's developed around social norms. So that's one of our big tasks that I think the group really wants to focus on is developing that curriculum so we can pass it off to the school district to make sure this is something that continues for years and years. All right, I guess at, at this time we're gonna open up to the questions. If you guys in the, in the, have any questions? That's a really great question, Rob. So I know that there are some studies, and I sound very ill-knowledgeable Ill at the moment. To s I know that there is something that suggests that whether or not we believe parents impact their youth, they do. There, there is something supporting that, and I could look into the literature on it. But I think that what you're pointing out is it's not that simple. These five A's are, are just kind of a drop in the bucket, and it's so much more than that. It's healthy relationships. It's accounting for that seeking of independence that young people have, that need for risk-taking and adventure. Um, so it, it goes well beyond that, but essentially I think it's how much can we focus on um, with, with a small amount of time and energy. And I'm sure there's an impact. I'm just not confident which way that impact goes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Kroger, a forum member. Thanks, thanks for coming in today. I actually have three quick questions. <laughs> One is, I was wondering if you had any connection at all with Alcoholics Anonymous or Alateen or any of those programs. The second one I was going to ask you was uh, if this uh, legalization move in Oregon and elsewhere for uh, marijuana and stuff might have a big impact on your efforts. And the third thing is I was wondering if you were doing or going to plan any, any uh, research that would take a look at the uh, people have problems or potential problems by ethnicity to see if maybe uh, an approach to trying to help them would be better specific, you know, specify the programs for specific cultures and things like that. Jaime, you look ready to talk. I want to take question two and three. Okay. Um, regarding Alcoholics Anonymous and just the recovery, recovery community, that is actually a population that we have some representation on our board right now. Um, do I think we could partner with them more? Yes, absolutely. It's a really fine balance, though, because you look at Prevention is essentially I mean, stopping something before it starts, right? And those agencies are really looking kind of more at the intervention side and the maintenance piece of it. So it's getting that perspective to make sure that we are really falling in line with that practice, but also not getting too hung up on that side of it because that could take away from the prevention side of it. But so yes, we are connected with the recovery community. All right, so I'll take uh, question two and three, uh, Bill. So question two about the legalization of marijuana. It's not gonna help us. Okay, um, it's going to wear, uh, but a couple of good things, that, number one is that it is going to wear, uh, it's going to raise awareness, but it's going to also force us to educate more, both at the voting, the voting age level and then those who are non-voters. But it's going to be about educating 
education. But the one good thing about the legalization of marijuana as, as it's passed in Colorado and up here to our neighbors to the north, why is that it's going to put an awareness on out there, good or bad, at least the focus is going to be on, you know, marijuana is it good, bad, or where do we plan a good educational plan to get that word out there. Then finally, the, the, the third one is about reaching out to uh, non-native speakers in the communities, whether they're, they're Asian, um, Spanish-speaking. We would love to get to a point where we can also be outreaching to those communities in their language, where they're comfortable at. It's one thing to have a, um, a room full of Latinos and Spanish speakers, but if you're giving them material in English, it really doesn't do any good. Uh, I'm, I'm one of maybe two or three Latinos on the board, so we need more. But it is about being able to outreach in their language, in their culture, where they're comfortable at. I have two extras on that. Um, regarding the potential legalization of marijuana, um, I think that speaks to the perception and obviously the potential availability, even just medical marijuana right now, um, presents an increase in accessibility. Um, but one thing I think we can feel confident about is it will not be legal for our young people. Uh, regardless of what happens, legalization I don't think will ever permit that anybody under the age of 18 at the very least is using. And that's a message that we can focus on and really reinforce is it's still young developing brains and the state and obviously the federal government do not endorse young people using substances. Um, and I really appreciate the question about reaching out to specific cultures and having a more targeted approach. I do think that we would be naive to say that one approach is going to address all of the populations within our community, and it goes so far beyond language. Mm -hmm. um, we need to really look at culturally, how are we going to impact these folks? How are we even gonna get them to our events? Because what might attract one population is not necessarily going to attract the next. So yes, thank you for bringing up that point. And it is a huge endeavor, um, but it's also a really important one. Chris Leslie, board member. Thank you again for both being here, uh, but specifically, what do you have in the way of a program for, say, a high school or grade school? What is your program? Great question. We haven't really done the programming because of our previous grant limitations. Um, so the Drug-Free Communities Grant really required us to focus on this population level change, which is um, law change, um, the kind of social culture that we have. But I'd say that the goal had been really looking at, when you talk about programming, getting those prevention clubs within the different realms where they would be kind of more age appropriate. So we started in the middle schools recognizing that that's that pivotal time where people make the choice to start using or not typically. The goal had been to get that up and running within the high schools. I think what we're gonna need to do though is A, recognize that working with those age groups is going to be different. Um, what's cool to them, what engages them is going to be different and same with the elementary level folks. Um, I imagine with the elementary it will be probably a lot of parent engagement and education and um, providing resources potentially for other opportunities there. Um, but that's a huge topic that the board really needs to go back to the drawing board on because we haven't been focusing there. So that's part of why we're here today is to get feedback from you guys and um, input partnerships, et cetera, about what, what, do, what do we need in this community? What programs should we be looking at? Whether it's just showing our support for those or actually trying to implement those, um, that's part of why we're here today. Are you duplicating counseling, no. drug counseling? No. No, we've got lots of very wonderful agencies in our community that people can certainly be referred to. Um, but again, that kind of speaks more to the intervention side of stuff. Uh, we do have some parenting programs, though, for the younger ages that try to focus on the prevention side of stuff. Thank you. Hi, Anthony Mills, uh, forum member. Um, you've talked about alcohol and marijuana. Um, not other drugs such as meth, which I don't know in Oregon, but certainly in the Midwest is, is a big problem. And compared to alcohol and um, marijuana, the devastating effects of meth within a family. Um, can you talk about meth and, and, and harder drugs, but in particular meth? Yes. Um, so I actually, to give you some background, I work with drug offenders. Um, and most of them have very, very significant drug problems most of them go far beyond alcohol and marijuana. Um, so I really appreciate the question. The effects of meth use, heroin use, are devastating to that person, that family, and essentially the community. 
the reason we focus on alcohol and marijuana is because they're the most widely used substances. So looking at kind of the biggest bang for your buck, I think that's part of why those are the main focus. That is not to say that the other things are less important. And while I don't like the idea of a gateway substance by any means, a lot of things start with the alcohol and marijuana. And so if we are able to catch that, the likelihood of being able to prevent the meth use, the heroin use, any kind of IV use, I think is more likely. Um, so it's an important message that you're bringing up. And I also would throw out there the concept of prescription pills. I think that that's, I'm um, talking about acceptability, access, um, perception of harm. That's an area where we're really falling short right now. We have this idea if it comes from a doctor, it's okay. Um, and young people are under the impression that they can abuse pain medications or prescription amphetamines. And it's that same kind of thing. But what we see is it's just such a small portion of the population that um, we, need, we need to acknowledge it. We need to do what we can with those things. But as far as big efforts go, I think that we'll probably stick with alcohol and marijuana. It's going to sound like the same question. Emily Nutt, for a member of Hillsboro resident. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of young people in youth sports. And my kids who wouldn't dream of smoking pot or drinking alcohol are tempted by steroids and painkillers. Do you guys get the impact that it's, maybe it's just my kids, but those are a lot more vulnerable to the athletes I work with than your entry level drugs? That I think goes back to this idea, we need to look at our community and see, yeah, so we, we identify that maybe these are the widely used substances, but what populations are at risk of certain things and how can we target those? I think we all dream of a day where Hay could say that we have intervention set up for young athletes or students who are really pressured to perform well in school um, that might be more likely to turn to these substances, kind of uh, essentially a more white collar type substance. Um, how can we affect those as well? Well, thank you for your hard work. I am, I'm sure it's a big challenge to be able to deal with all of these kids that are out there. My name is Wayne Potter, a uh, member, and I'm interested, in, this may be a question you're dealing with in terms of your looking, examining how you, where you want to go and so on. And this, uh, I'm just curious about what your perception is of your role. Are you an enabler of groups? Are you a resource group? Do you provide your own programs? So how do you perceive that, or have you talked about it yet? That's a big question. I think really uh, the resource is, is the best thing. So I've, the Hillsborough School District at one point was looking at new curriculums for their um, health classes. And how can we make sure that we're giving the best information to our young people um, within the school setting? And so that was an area where they actually asked us for help to look into what are the, the kind of cutting edge curriculums that really speak <coughs> to the issues that you guys are bringing up right now. Um, which is the really extreme drug use, that kind of other population that might be susceptible to drug use, um, giving all of that education to our students. So it's really, our goal is to be a resource for the community, um, a resource broker, if you will. And at some levels, I think that is providing a service, but really a coalition is most effective when we've got all of our partners at picking up part of it. So we don't want to be the sole provider of those services. We need to make sure that the other agencies we're working with are able to help with that. Yeah, and to, and to follow up with that, Wayne, yes. So the, um, the current board is in transition. Um, this last June, we finished a, a five-year grant which gave us, they gave us resources to make a good strategic plan for the last five years. Now we're going forward, we've got less resources, uh, getting, getting new board members on board, training them to what the mission statement is for the, the, the Hay group. But uh, looking forward is about collaborating with other organizations in the community and making sure that we, have, we all, together, have planned programs going forward. Hi, Bill Kroger again. <laughs> you said you wanted some feedback. Uh, to my knowledge, the legislature is uh, considering a bill in regarding uh, legalization of marijuana to send out to the voters. And I, unless you haven't already, I think right now would be a super good time to contact our local legislators and maybe the committees about the possibility of getting some funding in there for advertising and programs to, to reach youth and stuff. I think it would be a very popular thing, and I think it might, uh, might have a good chance of going. That's a great idea. Thank you. That's, in fact, I think we have some uh, local...
some state government folks coming to our next meeting, so they might be a good good place to start that conversation. Again, thank you, Bill. And I, in the last ten days, I've met with three uh, representatives in the state, and I've talked to them specifically about the mar marijuana legalization and how they perceive the not just the vote itself, but if the vote passes, if, if we do have legalized marijuana, there's a lot of things that we got to make sure that logistically we pr we provide. In the, as far as, as at least at my point, is educating the voting block, both those over 20, 18 to vote and those under 18. But again, I've already had three conversations, and going forward, that may be a topic as board members that we have some reps come in and talk to us so that we can message correctly. Eric Squires, or a member, got a question for each of you. Pick the one you want. I'd like one of you to talk about the 12 sectors, and I'd like another one of you to talk about positive community norms. But in this context, for the positive community norms question, one of the community norms that's changed that is counter to drug prevention is my opinion. I'm going to share this, that I think that marijuana has grown in acceptance and that nationally we've had a conversation about legalization that's been coming from the president down. So that's kind of been a game changer. So one of you, could you talk about the 12 sectors? And the other one, could you talk about community norms, but how we have a new norm with legalization of marijuana pending? Which one do you want? I'll the new norms. Go for it. Okay. Uh, very good questions. Who is this young man? <laughs> Uh, so Eric, yeah, it is about um, new norms within the community, um, and you can just talk. You know, a generation ago we weren't talking about marriage equality, but now we're accepting it more, more as a community and nationwide too. Uh, but also on the on the front of legalization of marijuana, we've already got two states that have already um, accepted it and made it law. But we also have a, a federal government that isn't enfor enforcing uh, federal marijuana um, substance controls laws. They're like putting it on the back seat. They know it's on the books, but they're so overwhelmed with funding resources, they're not going to worry about it, specifically in Colorado and Washington. However, the new, community, the new community norm, it is about the fact that marijuana is being more accepted. And I think, I, at least in my opinion, it's because we've allowed medical marijuana now to be prevalent and be acceptable. Uh, it's, it's coming to a close that the younger generation is starting to accept things that we, when we were at that younger generation, it was just a no-no. You know, so it is, it's, it's a continuing growth going forward, but it's also making sure that we have the right message, making sure that we educate. So if it is going to be the new normal, that we at least are aware of it and are aware of the abuse and the destructiveness that it can happen. Yeah, that's, I mean, I would go back to just the idea that the, regardless of what the norms are going to be, our new norm should not be that young people use marijuana. Um, whether or not it's legal within our community, whether or not there are medicinal purposes for it, um, in my opinion, is mutually exclusive, whether or not it's acceptable for young people to be doing that. Um, there's a huge, huge importance in delivering that message, though, and maintaining credibility. We all remember Reefer Madness and how um, ridiculous that was and how much it kind of sent people in the opposite direction, like what you're talking about, Rob, just that idea of um, the more we push something on somebody, the more likely they are to rebel. I think that had the opposite effect. So somewhere in all of this, um, recognizing the changes in our, our nation, essentially, is we need to maintain credibility. Is marijuana going to kill you? No, probably not directly. Um, but we need to look at what effects it potentially could have on somebody, um, what potential effects it has on a growing brain, um, and really using those as our platforms for educating the community and hopefully preventing young people from using. And to go back to the 12 sectors, um, I have to look at my sheet so that I don't leave any out because they're all really important. But there are essentially through the SAMHSA grant, this is how I was at least originally aware of them, there's 12 different sectors of the community that are equally as important in engaging um, population level change. Um, so looking at drug and alcohol prevention, we're looking at youth. Obviously, we need them to be part of the messaging, to endorse it, to carry it forward, to model those things for their um, peers, et cetera, and parents to make sure they have the right education and deliver consistent messages. Uh, the business community, let's be honest, they're a great source of um, funding, potentially. They also have a great pulse on advertising ideas. There's just this whole, uh, I think, window that can be opened with engagement of the, the business community. 
the media, where would we be without the media? People wouldn't have our messaging, um, which is so, so important when you're looking at the population. Um, the schools, we're looking at targeting school-aged youth, so we want to make sure that um, everybody in Hillsborough School District is on the same page as in, and engaged in um, carrying this message forward and doing their part in preventing drug and alcohol use and responding to it appropriately when it does occur. Um, any youth serving agencies, the Boys and Girls Club, um, lots of different counseling agencies that um, exist and are working with our young people, they have the best uh, probably pulse on what's going on, what are kids doing for fun, how can they engage them, um, and also like Parks and Rec, how can we get in there and be doing cool stuff with these kids? The idea of saying don't use drugs as a prevention club doesn't really sound very fun. We have to spin it in a way that they're doing something and, and what are you doing as a part of that? Law enforcement. Um, law enforcement's been a great partner in our community. The Hillsborough Police Department, Washington County Sheriff's Office have both been outstanding in helping us with uh, prescription drug take backs. We actually have a permanent box now at the Sheriff's Office. We didn't have that years ago. People were flushing their meds down the toilet, they were throwing them out, they were leaving them in their medicine cabinets where their kids could potentially get to them. Um, and now we have events that go on that, where people can dispose of those safely, or they can go to the Sheriff's Office, I believe 24 hours a day to drop off their meds. So law enforcement partnerships are huge. Uh, religious or fraternal organizations, there's a lot of faith-based groups within Hillsboro that we can tap into, uh, the Lions Club, um, I know there's other fraternal organizations I'm missing right now, but really that are all about improving their communities and th these are volunteers or people that are really focused on being there that want to join in to better the community that their young people are growing up in. Uh, civic and volunteer groups, healthcare professionals, Talk about knowing the health risks, um, probably the best resources for that kind of stuff, the best potential, um, oh, look at that, Eric's got a lockbox. Um, th the best people to get us connected with our hospitals when we're looking at gathering data, um, hosting events to all of these, been a really great partner for us in the, the past. Um, state, local, and uh, tribal governance, specifically with expertise in the substance abuse field. Um, so I know Washington County has been abundantly supportive of Hay, and I believe plans to continue to do so in recognizing that Hillsboro is part of the county. And if we want to impact the county, we got to start at our local cities. Um, and also the state government, when and if that's a, an option. And then any other organizations that are involved in reducing, reducing substance use. Um, there was a really good long time we had some folks from um, a counseling agency that works with drug and alcohol use, um, family focused type stuff, and they were a really important part of our message because it was looking at, you know, we can look at all this data, um, and while that's very, very useful, we have to make sure that what we're, where we're focusing our efforts is important. Um, it's also really important to get that anecdotal information. What is it that people are seeing when, the, when they are dealing with these types of issues? What do these families look at, look like? and how can we better affect them. So having that representation, I mean, that just took me, what, a good five minutes to go through all of these folks, is so important because there's so many different perspectives and ways that people can contribute. So we are really looking forward to building our board and our coalition back up in a way that we are representative of these stakeholders so that we can be the most successful here in Hillsborough. And then I would just like, like to add that as a board member, I want to be as competent as I can um, I, I've been on the board about a year now, and I figured I'd just be Hillsboro locally here, getting, making aware about drug abuse, substance abuse to youth. But at the same time, as a board member, I want to know as much as I can. Tomorrow night, I will be attending a Latino Health out of Portland to learn more about what can I get from that table to bring back to the board members here at Hay. You've been very patient. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thank you again. This is sort of a question I'll date myself. Uh, you ever hear of dope addicts? Yeah. That was anything from marijuana to heroin. That's where I grew up. And dope means you're stupid. <laughs> That's one of the D's. Yeah. Uh, it's demeaning and everything. The use of dope. Uh, and I don't support marijuana, except for paying taxes, maybe. But it's really a, a detriment to people to use substance abuse drugs. 
and I want to present you with this box that which was placed near me, oh. and you can explain that at your leisure. But again, what uh, are you working with the kids to really learn how to read and using Spanish uh, literature to inform them of the dangers of drug use? Things like that. Those are things I would think in your program. Um, yes, absolutely. That's so. This has been kind of a rough year because I think we had a lot of momentum and there was a lot of things happening within the school and just based on the timing of some staff changes and leadership changes, I don't feel like we've had nearly as much of the presence in the schools this year as we have historically. But uh, that was kind of part of this concept of the prevention clubs. I know I keep going back to them was they, I mean, at assemblies are presenting this information, educating their, um, the, the school population, not just the folks in that club about the potential harms and stuff like that. So that's been part of it. It's been really interesting because over the years we've had lots of folks that want to bring in different types of educators. Um, and one of them was the idea of having like trauma nurses come in or doing this fake car accident after a drunk driving thing. And there's these like shock and awe things that really are captivating and people pay attention to and they're engaged in while they're there. But when it's looking at kind of that long-term effect, they are not quite as meaningful. Those things don't stick in somebody's head. They don't think they're going to be the young person who has the car accident. Um, so it's been finding ways to provide that education that's engaging while still kind of being true to what's most effective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, and the box. So this is a prescription lock box. It's something that um, Hay felt really strongly about. and We purchased quite a few of them. I think we actually have a lot if anybody's interested. Um, but the idea is it's a coded lockbox for people to put their prescription medicine into. Um, everybody thinks if it's in the medicine cabinet it's high and out of reach that the young people can't get to it. They can climb on counters, etc. Um, we all want to think the best about our children. Um, I think that's inherent and obviously a really beautiful thing. But it's also our job as parents to take that opportunity away from people. Um, and so the idea of just locking up any prescription medicine to prevent any um, accidental issues that could arise or certainly in, uh, purposeful misuse, um, just taking that off the table altogether. So prescription lock boxes. Easily identifiable with a, a, a cross and a lock made on it. Hi, thank you very much for uh, being here in your presentation. It's really interesting, a lot of good information for us to take home, think about, and maybe, who knows, maybe somebody here would like to become a board member. It's always okay. possible. All right, that's true. Uh, John McWilliams, board, um, board member here, so uh, at the forum. Um, I'm wondering, I've heard a lot about Hillsborough, and that's because you're Hillsborough Center right now. Um, there's other cities in Washington County. Um, are there any other cities that are doing anything like this? Or do you have uh, city satellite um, groups? Or how does this work maybe at a larger scale we can reach more youth? Great question. Um, Washington County is fortunate in that we have a lot of coalitions actually right now. So Tiger Tualatin has mm -hmm. Tiger Turns the Tide. They're an outstanding coalition that does um, similar work. Obviously their approaches really fit their community the best. Um, Beaverton also has one. So Tualatin just came up with their own. Forest Grove is in the middle of, of mobilizing their community. I know Sherwood has thought about doing this and has a task force together. So it's catching fire in the county. And what's been really neat with that is we've had partnerships with the existing coalitions over the last several years, thanks to Washington County, really the Commission on Children and Families formerly known as, um, brought us all together to look at specific campaigns to do throughout the year as a partnership. And one of those was a campaign called Prom Perfect. And with that, it was this countywide messaging about being safe on prom night and changing that norm of people go use after prom. Um, it had the florists, uh, limousine companies, tuxedo places, all these folks were engaged in presenting this message to be safe and healthy. Um, parents were texting their kids. It was this really, really amazing group effort that um, went throughout the whole county. So we do have kind of these bigger, bigger groups that do get together. It's been really for focused 
um, events at this time. And then to, to speak on an even bigger scale, there's the metro area coalitions, which is um, expanding even out of Washington County, looking at like Gresham. Um, I know Clark County out of Vancouver has got some folks that come in. So it's really what's, what's our metro area look like and how can we all work together? I think when we're looking at the legalization issue, that's an area that the metro area coalitions has really wanted to get together on. And whether or not, you know, there's prevention of the passing of something like that, but really what can we do to make sure that it's as safe as possible? Um, so yes, to answer your question, there are, there are those folks existing elsewhere and we are trying to work together as best as we can. With that being the end of the questions, I'm going to call for some applause for two great presenters. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you're off the hook. Thank Woo. you. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Attention. Thank you so much. Thanks. Folks, I'm going to wind things down with just a few brief announcements. Take me down a bit, Joseph. Um, on the 17th, we have a confirmation that uh, we have the Allen and Andy show for the Washington County Commissioners. Uh, on the, and that's going to be followed up at the same program with the Brian and Jason House District 34 show. On March 24th, we're going to have uh, County Commissioners, uh, the Greg and Bob show. We've got Bob in the house. Um, so we'll have uh, District 2 commissioners and also District 4 commissioners, uh, uh, the Honorable Elizabeth First and Bob Terry. Uh, those are just sent to me by uh, John McWilliams, who does a phenomenal job with programming. And what I'd like to do is pull up, uh, let you know that next week we have County Auditor John Hutzler, who's also on our board. He will be presenting. Uh, a program that I think is going to be very interesting is uh, Portland Community College President Dr. Jeremy Brown will be here March 3rd. March 10th, uh, a program, again, that John McWilliams booked is uh, Tom Marsh. He's author of To the Promised Land, A History of Government and Politics in Oregon. I was reading a little bit about this uh, author and his presentation. I think that's going to be remarkably interesting. So uh, with that being said, I want to conclude today's forum, invite you back in a week for our auditor's presentation. Please drive safe. Have a good week. Bye-bye.